Praise the Lord. All right, we'll open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to all stand in honor of the Word of God. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, we're going to just start in verse 1 and read down through verse number 6. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 through verse 6. 1 John, and uh, for, uh, for Brother Dotson, that's in the Old Testament back there, and... No, I'm just kidding. First John chapter two, verse number one, and we're going to read. To, uh, we're going to read responsively. In other words, I'm going to read verse number one. We'll all read together on verse two. Then I'll read verse number three. We'll all read together on verse four, all the way down through verse six. So I'm going to start out. First John chapter two, verse number one. The Bible says, "My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous." And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth His word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in Him." He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Amen. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we sure do love you. Thank you, Lord, again, for the opportunity to get to be in the house of God. Lord, I love to get up and preach the word of God, and I love to come to church, be around God's people, see the smiling faces, Lord, get to, Lord, fellowship with other, peop- other believers, Lord, and get to have that common fellowship of, Lord, uh, of peace and knowing that heaven's our home. And that, Lord, you're coming back soon. And, Lord, just thank you so much, Lord, for the day that we get to be here, Lord, and get to hear the Word of God. May you now, Holy Spirit, fill the room. May you fill me with power that as we preach, Lord, the Word of God would, uh, Lord, would go and, and touch the hearts of every person in the room. That, Lord, we'd learn something from the Word of God. We would grow today, and, Lord, because of the Word of God. We love you. Thank you so much for everything that you've done. ask that you'd bless. May all we do and say honor and glorify you. We love you. We thank you. ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In 1 John uh, here, there's many times where John, uh, as we know, wrote this book. The same man that wrote the book of John also wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, and the book of Revelation. But in this book, he, he addresses the, God's people here as my little children. He addresses them as little children. And I've, my first thought in reading this portion of Scripture is why did John address these people this way? When we start out, we see what he's, that he's talking, he's addressing them, and he starts out, my little children. I'm going to need some help this morning. Let me see. DJ, can you help me? Come on. Come on up here. I like his suit and it's tie. I told him he can't come to church looking better than me, but he comes every week just looking sharp. So come on up here. Up here for me. I'm going to have you stand with me. Stand right here for me for a second. All right. So... My first thought reading this is we're going to start out. John addresses them as my little children. Now, I was going to use Adlin, but I don't think that she would stay up here long enough for me to, she would crawl around on the platform. So we're going to pretend here for a second. Uh, You're my son. Oh, boy. No, I'm kidding. Okay? And, uh, And just to give you an idea, John here is talking to God's people, and he calls them my little children for a couple reasons, I believe. Number one, it's a spiritual term. John is referencing these uh, as God's people as a spiritual term, calling them his little children. He has had a direct result in the life of these young Christians. And he has watched them trust the Lord as their Savior and maybe even led them to the Lord himself. And let's go real quick, Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 2. I'm going to set a, a little bit of a foundation here. Everybody in this room is a child. Everybody in the room is a child. John addresses every child of God, adult, teenager, child. He addresses all of them in that statement, my little children. But why? Well, let's look. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 2. There's two types of children. Where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, in verse number 2, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So we see there's children of disobedience. And then go to Ephesians 5, 8. Ephesians 5, verse 8. 
It says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So there's two types of children that God is comparing to. God's people, uh, uh, or God is comparing people of the world to either children of disobedience or children of darkness or children of light. Disobedience and obedience. What that's talking about is to the gospel. When God says, for, all, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When you get saved, you become a child of light, a child of obedience to the gospel. Uh, those that are not saved are children of darkness, children of disobedience. And so this is a spiritual term. So he is addressing children, as a, in, or he's addressing people as children in a spiritual sense, talking about whether or not they're saved. Amen. When you're a child of God, you're born again, but you're either a child of God or a child of the devil. Amen. God says that you are of your father, the devil, as well in another portion of Scripture. Talking about how that you have, a, we are compared to his children, and God is our father if you're saved and born again. If you're not saved this morning, then the devil's your father, according to God's word. And so John addresses my little children in a spiritual sense. He's talking to saved people, people that are born again. They've accepted Jesus as their Savior. They no longer have the devil as their father. They've received the adoption of sons and become a child of God. So, but we can compare it in a physical sense to a father and son relationship. How that we're uh, children of God. God is our father. I believe also he mentions this term as not just a spiritual term, but an endearing term. John is talking to them as spiritual saved, but as just as a father would to a son, he, he calls them my little children. John loved these people. So just as a father would to a son and say, my son, now I want you to listen to me. John's getting ready to instruct these people here in 1 John. He's getting ready to give them some uh, pointers. He's getting ready to tell them what God has for them. And he is talking to them spiritually, but he's talking to them as children saying, now listen, my son, I, I, want, you, you know, I've got some, I want to tell you something. Okay? Because a father has a conversation with a son because he loves him. I'm sure that Brother Donald and DJ are going to have many conversations coming. <laughs> now son, my son, I want you to listen to me. John is talking to them as his children. He's had a part in their life. He loves these people. He's helped win them to the Lord. He's helped watch them grow and watch them as children of God. He takes their welfare seriously. He took, their, he took personal responsibility for these, for these people. He was, he was endearing. He was, in, he, was showing them, he was showing them his love by telling them, My little children, please listen. Amen. We as Christians can come to the place where we love people so much that we're willing to help. And we can, not like John, maybe my little children, but we begin to en endear people to ourselves and show people that we love them. <coughs> Number three, it was a challenging term. He was saying this in love, showing his love, but he was doing it in a way that he wants them to realize there's an urgency. My little children, these things write I unto you. He wants them to know he loves them, but he's challenging them as well, saying, listen up. Hear me. Listen to what I have to tell you. I believe that we can use this in the sense as well, the application for that, uh, for all three of these terms, is that the Word of God is written to us, and God is our Heavenly Father. The Word of God is written from our Heavenly Father to us as children of God. And like John, God uses the same, uh, it, God uses this talking to us. We are His children. And so, like God, or like John, God says, my little children. He addresses you and I in this portion of Scripture as well. This is not just from John to these people. This is God's word to us as children of God. And God addresses us as well, saying, my little children. So God addresses us in a spiritual term. You must be saved this morning. Amen. For God to say, my little children, you have to be born again. Amen. If you're not saved this morning, this is not for you. Because this is for God's children. Amen. God wants you to be born again, but God calls for His children, my little children. It's a spiritual term. To understand God's Word, amen, you must be saved. You must be born again. And so to understand what God's calling you to, and to know the, and to know the relationship that you have with God, you must be born again. 
I believe God also uses this as an endearing term to us, just like John did. God wants us to know that He cares about us. He calls us His little children. Amen? God doesn't just say, hey, listen up. No, God in His Word says, my little children. God wants you to know He loves you this morning. God wants you to know that He cares about you. And like, he, like a father would a son, God cares about you as His children. God takes personal responsibility for us in giving us the Word of God to help us to grow. Children have a natural desire to grow. I don't know if you know that, but if you have children, you know that. <laughs> children have a natural desire to grow. DJ, can you walk? Yeah, of course. Very good, very good. <laughs> Very nice. Can you understand what I'm telling you? Yeah. Can you, here, sit in the chair. Very good, okay? No, go ahead. You can stay seated. I, I want you to sit down because I'm, I'm going to use you in just a second. But children have a natural desire to grow. They want to learn. They want, they're inquisitive. They want to find things. They want to search out things. Amen? You give them a mud puddle and they want to figure out what they can do and how many things they can do in a mud puddle. I know. I used to. I still do, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> There's mud puddles out here with all that land. You got to use it for something, amen. So uh, my wife gets on to me when all that snow was out there. And uh, yeah, it was great. But <laughs> children want to grow. And we as children of God, if you're saved, you're born again, there ought to be a desire to grow. As a Christian in your life, being born again, you are a child of God, there ought to be a desire to grow closer to your father. For a child, for a son, there is a desire to know his father. There's a desire to grow in a relationship to his father. And so as a Christian, there should be a desire to know more about God. God puts in us a new creature, a new spirit, the Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the, by the renewing of your minds. There ought to be a new desire, not to know the old world, but to want to know God. God cautions us that if we do not have a desire to know God, then we are to check our salvation. Not that we're not saved, but God says in a Christian there should be a desire to grow. And we could be just so backslidden where we have no desire to grow anymore because we've just fallen so far from God just as a child. There are times when there are children that have no desire to know their parents. There are children like that. It's sad to see a relationship separate. But it can get to a point where there's no desire to grow, no desire to know that relationship. We can be the same with God where there's no desire to no longer fellowship with God, but at that point is a scary point in a Christian's life. But another, but like I said, God says to check though, when there's no desire to get to know God, it may be that we have the wrong father. Amen. Are you born again this morning? Are you saved? Amen. God wants you to know He loves you. He says, my little children, understand I love you. When God gives us these things in His Word, He wants us to know His love for us. But he also challenges us. It's a challenging term. God wants us to know that he's warning us. There's something that God has for us. He's addressing his little children, and he's saying, there, these things write I unto you. God's giving us something. God's going to challenge us this morning to do more for him. So when he challenges us, there may be things that God challenges us in the things that, God, that we're going to go through. But we have to understand that God does that also in love. It's an endearing term. God wants to know He loves us. And in challenging us, He does it in love. Just like a father challenges his son, He does it in love. Son, don't do that. Why? Because you love your son. You say, don't touch that. You challenge them. You say, go work. Why? Well, Dad, I don't want to go work. Well, go work. Why, but Dad, I don't want to. But you make them. Why? Because you challenge them. Because you know what they need to grow properly. God wants us to grow properly as children. Do you have a desire to grow today? Is there a burning desire to know God? There ought to be. Amen. And we're going to learn some things this morning from where God or where there where uh, John addresses these uh, people, and I believe that God addresses us as well through His Word. Number one, 
Look there, my little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What a great verse, amen. If you find somebody that tries to tell you work salvation, you just open up to 1 John 2, 1 and 2, amen. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. And he died and gave his life. He is our advocate, amen. Baptism is not your advocate. The church is not your advocate. The pastor is not your advocate. Jesus Christ, the righteous, amen, is the advocate. And he is the propitiation for our sins. But I love it. And not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world, amen. God died for everybody. Man, what a, what a great thought that Jesus gave his life for the whole world. All the sins ever combined, all the sins ever done from the beginning of humanity to the very end, Jesus died for every last one of them. Amen. Somebody says, well... Not everybody can be saved, or maybe there's sins that you can do that could keep you from being saved, but my friend, the Bible says he died for the sins of the whole world. That's to everybody, amen? There's nobody excluded, amen? Jesus died for everybody. And so John is telling us to remember that you're going to sin. You're going to fail, but you're washed, amen? I put it in this way. I did all ease this morning. So here you go. If you're taking notes, it's in all ease. I alliterated. I love alliterating, okay? Number one, we are emancipated children. We are emancipated children. We are set free from sin. We are no longer held by death's grip or sin's sway. We now walk a heavenly way, amen? God's desires for every individual, everyone in the whole world to be born again, to be a child of God. He died for everyone, amen? It is our job, number one. We're, we need to remember we're born again, but reach the world. But in so doing, God says, remember that he wrote this unto us so that we would sin not. The difference is, yes, you're born again, but what they're, the difference that there ought to be between children of disobedience and children of obedience is that we should strive to sin less. You should not be the same as you were five years ago. We ought to be different. Like I said, we ought to grow in a desire to know God. The closer you get to God, the farther you get away from sin. God says it's His desire. He wrote these unto us. Why? So that we would sin not. It is not God's desire for you to live a sinful life. Can I help you this morning? God does not desire to watch you live your life in sin. God does not desire to watch you listen to bad music. God does not desire to watch you drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes, all of those things that God gives a boundary on. That's not God's desire. God doesn't want you to, de to destroy this temple that He gave to you. God doesn't want you to live in sin. God doesn't want your mind to be filled with sin. It's not God's desire. God's desire is that you sin not. Amen. Salvation is not a, uh, a spiritual check to do whatever you want. It's not a spiritual credit card to run up on God. God's desire is that you begin to sin less. Too many Christians think, well, I'm saved. I can do whatever I want. God says, no, he wants us to sin not. But if you do fail, just remember, you are going to fail. You're going to wake up every morning and go, dear Lord, what did I do again? Dear Lord, I failed again. Then, God, then that's why he says, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Just remember you're born again, amen? There's nothing you can do. You're going to fail over and over and over. In striving to live the Christian life, in striving to not sin, you're going to fail. Because none of us are perfect till we reach heaven. This isn't saying that if you don't, if, that as, a, as a Christian you're never going to sin. What it's saying is, is remember to strive to not sin. But when you do fail, remember Jesus Christ has paid for it. Jesus Christ is your advocate. Jesus is forgiving. Jesus will take that and, and keep using you. Jesus says, don't just remember that I've forgiven you, that you're saved, you're born again, that I still love you. Amen. That's the blessing about it. Yes, you're going to fail. Yes, you're going to wake up in the morning and say, God, I don't deserve to walk into church. The whole roof's going to fall down on me. 
But God says, remember, I'm your advocate. Jesus has paid for it. But go and sin no more. Amen. Like, he said to the, like Jesus said to the woman, go and sin no more. So we're emancipated children. We're set free. We no longer have sin's hold, sin's sway. But also in this verse, we should be example children. We should be, an exam- we should be example children. When people want to know around us as Christians, maybe there's new Christians that come in. Maybe there's people that are baby Christians want to grow as well. They should be able to look at us and know what God's, how God says we ought to live. A lot of times Christians are saved for many, many years and still live the same life. They've not grown. And a new Christian comes in and wants to know, how can I grow? How can I be closer to God? Can they look at you as an example? Amen? Just because we're not born again doesn't give us the right not to grow. God wants us to grow. And God knows that there are those that we can influence and be an example to. Amen? They're trying to leave the old life. And most Christians are going back to it. God says, remember, to be an example to those. Amen? Sin not. Amen? Be an example. Number three, we're to be earnest children. 1 John 2, verse 18. Are you comfortable? Doing good? Okay. We're coming back to you. Hold on. 1 John 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. So, here we go. Ready? Come on. Stand up here for me. So God says, all right, number one, we have a relationship. As a son to a father, you're born again. But God says, remember as well that we're to be earnest. It's the last time. God is talking to us and he says, listen, it's the last time. I'm getting ready to come back. The world's going to end. Amen. We don't have long. We're not to be just examples. We're to be earnest. Because Jesus is coming. We're to work harder than ever before. We're to do more than we've ever done. We're not to slack off. It's not time to pull back. It's not time to let the devil get us into sleep mode. Amen. It's time to wake up. Because it's the last time. Jesus says there, we saw verse 18, Little children, is the last time as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. There's many people out there claiming to have the way, claiming and pulling people into, into false doctrine. Antichrist trying to lead pe- people astray. And we as Christians must be earnest to preach the gospel. We must be earnest to live the Christian life. We must be earnest to give God everything we have while we have time. This may be the last time that, or this may be the last day that you live. This may be the last breath that you take. This may be the last church service you go to. This may be the last meal that you eat today. It may be the last time with your family, the last opportunity you have to witness, the last sermon you hear, the last sunset you see. It may be the last drive home. It may be the last of everything. It's the last time. So God says, be more fervent than ever. Don't slack off. Don't let the devil slow you down. Don't stay home from church. Don't stay home from God's house. Go go now because it may be the last time you have an opportunity to be faithful to God. If today was your last day, what would you do? Think about it. It's a common question, but good for the thought. What would we do if we had one more chance to serve God? Would you still do the same you're doing? If God told you, you've got one more week, what would you do? God says, little children, listen to me. You don't have long. Listen to me. We're, I'm coming back. It may be the last time you have an opportunity to spend time with your family. It may be the last time you have to witness to those loved ones that you know that are lost. It may be the last time that you have an opportunity to be in church and keep your family right with God. It may be the last time you have to be born again if you're not saved. It's the last time. Jesus said, I come when no man thinketh. It may be the last time you have an opportunity today. Serve God as if it was your last day. We're to be earnest children, understanding that at any time the Father could come. Jesus is like the good man that's gone away on a far journey, and he'll return at the day appointed. But no man knows when that day is. It could be today. He could split the sky today and call us home. 
Are you ready to stand before the Lord? If not, let's be earnest. If God gives us another day, let's be earnest children. Let's be earnest in our serving service for God. Let's get the gospel out. Let's be faithful, amen? Give God your life. Maybe you've slacked off. Come at the altar at invitation and tell God, I'm going to do more for God. Number four, we're to be enduring children. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. God says, abide in Him. Why? So that you can be confident and not ashamed at His coming. He says, little children, listen. Time to abide in me. Time to abide in Christ. Continue. Be enduring. Wherever I go, you go. Wherever I lead, you lead. Stay in the Word of God. Stay in prayer. Time to abide in Christ. You can go sit down. Thank you, DJ. God says, listen, little children. Now is not the time to love the world. Now is not the time to love the flesh and the devil. Now is not the time to be taken by the lusts of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Now is the time to abide in Christ. Too many Christians show to church and that's the only time they've opened their Bible all week. God says abide in Him. Abide. Continue. Amen. Don't falter or fail as children. We don't continue do, living the Christian life to be saved. We continue because we are saved and we want to grow more with God. The only way you're going to grow is by abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ takes reading your Bible every day, praying, talking to God, being in church, serving God, all of those things, abiding. The Bible says in John 15, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Without me, ye can do nothing. You have to abide in the branch. You have to be connected to God. You've got to, be, uh, you've got to have God's power in your life. And that comes from abiding in Jesus. Amen. If you don't have Christ, if you're not abiding, if you're not continuing, the Bible says you'll wither, you'll die spiritually. You shrivel up because there's no life. Because without Jesus, you can do nothing. That's why, as we talked about in Sunday school, Demas departed. Why? He wasn't abiding in Christ. He shriveled up spiritually. He left. He loved the world more than he loved God. So spiritually he shriveled up and could no longer do the work of God. Why? Because you can't do it without God. We are to abide in Him. Why? We need God's power. Listen, this may be the last opportunity that you have to pray and beg God to fill you with God's power. Maybe you've never felt God's power in your life. Maybe you've never uh, witnessed God using you in a great way. Well, then make a decision. It may be the last time you have a chance to allow God to use you. Every Christian ought to be able to stand before God and say, God, I know that I had your power. Sad if a Christian never, never witnesses the power of God in his life. Should not be so. We should all have a time. We should all know every day that we pray and beg God and know God uses us and that God's power fills our lives. But it comes by abiding in Him. But we do that. Why abide? Why continue? Why be faithful? Why give your life? Why serve God? Why go soul winning? Why witness? Why do all that? Because when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed. When Jesus comes... If you've been abiding, God says you'll be confident. Why? Because you'll know you stand before Him and say, God, I did my best. But if you've not been abiding, if you've not been living for God, if you've not been in your Bible, if you've not been studying God's Word, been in church, then you're going to be ashamed. Because God says He wants His children to abide. But there are some children that will disobey. Not that you're not saved, but you've been a disobedient in abiding and you're ashamed. Say, God, I'm, I'm sorry. God will look at you and ask, what did you do with your time? What did you do with, your, with yourself? Did you live for me? God will ask you, amen. God will want to know, did you serve him? God won't bring up your sin. Your sins are forgiven. But you'll be ashamed to have to tell God, I didn't live for you. I loved the world too much. I loved my sin too much. Little children, listen. God wants us to abide.
God wants us to be enduring children. Staying faithful. Giving our lives to God. Every day. Amen. Number five. 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made in perfect love. Let me see here. I messed up. Got the wrong verse here. But 1 John 4, we're to be evident children. We're to be evident children. Amen. Uh, if you see here, First, uh, go back to verse 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he of God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Amen. God wants our love for him to be evident. God wants our love for him to be evident. Not just to be a... Uh, a uh, Christian by word, but to be a Christian by deed and truth. Amen. God says that he that loveth, uh, he that, God says not to love him in word, but to love him in deed and truth. Amen. God wants to love him, uh, God wants us to love him in deed. Uh, and here we go, First, uh, First John 3, 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. I wrote down 4.18, it was 3.18, so for your notes, change that. There you go. God says there's some that will love. There's some children that will say, I love you, God, but they don't show it. I love you, Father, but I'm going to stay home from church Sunday night. I love you, Father, but I can't witness to my family. I'm too ashamed. God says don't love him in word. Let it burn in you to know your father so much that you do it in deed. Amen. Many Christians come and act like, God, act like a Christian on Sunday in front of God and go home and live like the devil on Monday. Why? Because they love Him in word. But God looks at your deed. Amen. God says, children, what you say, as He said to the Pharisees, your mouth says one thing, but your hearts are far from me. Amen. God says, do it in deed, but also in truth. There's lots of people that serve God. There's lots of people in church. But they don't serve God for truth. They have bad intentions. They serve God for not in honesty, not for the Lord, but for a pat on the back. God says He wants you to serve Him. He wants you to work for Him and do it in deed, but also do it when nobody's looking. Do it in truth. Not as a lie. Amen. My little children, God says, don't love in word, neither in tongue. The tongue can move as much as it wants. But what are you doing for God? Amen. Number six. And we'll be done here in just a second. First John 4, 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We are to be endeavoring children. Amen. We are to be endeavoring. We are to overcome. Amen. We are not to be overcome by sin. We are set free from sin. There is nothing in your life as far as sin that can take you. God says you can overcome anything. You can endeavor. You can work hard. God can give you the strength and the victory over sin. Today, maybe you battle with sin. Maybe there's something you battle in your life that it, it, it's a besetting sin. It, it constantly, you dwell day after day and, and, and you say, God, it, it's a weight to me. God says you have the victory. You are to be an overcomer because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. There's nothing in this world that can hold you back. If you just get a hold of God, if you abide in Christ, you can overcome anything. Amen. Lots of Christians, sometimes we use besetting sin as an excuse. Well, pastor, that's my besetting sin. I can't get rid of it. It's my personality. God says that He's given us the victory over all sin. Besetting sin becomes an excuse in a lot of Christians' lives. I can't serve God because I have this besetting sin. It's just, that's, that's what it says in the Bible. It's my besetting sin. I can't get rid of it. God says... Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You can overcome anything. 
There's no excuse why we can't do more for God. There's no excuse why we can't know God more. God's given us the power to overcome anything, amen? But it's through the Holy Spirit of God. It's through that abiding in Christ. When you're abiding in Christ, you'll know God's power to overcome the world. A Lots of Christians can't get over sin. Well, God, I don't seem to overcome. Are you abiding? Lots of Christians, God, I can't get over my sin. I'm staying back here. I, I, I can't get closer to you. And then they come, Pastor, what do I do? Let me give you a hint. Be in church. You want to overcome sin? Start with being in church. How, how are you faithful to church? Number two, are you faithful to Bible reading? You read your Bible every day. What you give your life to is what your body will do. What you fill your mind with is what your mind will think. What you fill your heart with, the Bible says, where your heart is or where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What do you invest in? Do you invest in God? Do you invest in the things of God? Or are you investing in the world? You can't overcome the world if you're investing in it. Amen. God says you can overcome. There's nothing that can hold you back. Amen. You can overcome anything. Amen. You can overcome the devil. Let me encourage you. God has given you the victory over any sin. Just abide. Amen. Don't let the devil make you think that he can hold you back, that the cords of sin are too tight because God's power is too strong. God can do it. Amen. Get a hold of God. And then last, 1 John 5, 21, the last statement. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. We're to be established children. We're to be established. God said an idol is anything that takes God's place in your life. Anything that has a higher priority than God. Anything that takes the preeminence. An idol is anything that you give more credence to than God. Amen. The children of Israel had idols. They replaced God with a golden calf and said, This is the reason I've had victory. This is what brought me out. And God hates that because it takes away the glory from God. What in your life takes away God's glory? What in your life has a higher priority than God? What in your life that if something came up, you'd miss church for? Well, this has come up. I, I, I've got to go. God says there shouldn't be anything that has a higher priority. What in your life would cause you to go backwards in the Christian life? Is there something? God, he says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourselves from things that will try to take the place of God. Keep your children from things that will try to take the place of God in their life. God's brought us out. There are lots of Christians that have backslid on God and forgotten where they've come from and allow idols to take the place of God. Amen. We're an idolatrous nation and we don't even know it. We've allowed idolatry to take our nation. Amen. We've allowed, and not just idols that in, 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 in churches. Amen. Uh, America is a nation. We were founded on God. We were founded on Jesus Christ and we've allowed other religions to bring in their idols and say, God didn't establish this nation, this did. Sad as a Christian, we don't stand up and say, God's the one that brought us out. God's the one that's delivered us. God's given us freedom. Don't let the Muslims try to take over. Don't let the other religions try to tell you that it's through, it's because of Mary or it's because of somebody else that's established us. No, God did it, amen. God's the one that brought us here. God's the one that's established and brought freedom. And God's the one that brings freedom to a Christian from sin. Don't forget that. Don't let the other religions try to tell you that there's another way. That's an idol. You give glory to God. Amen. A Christian can forget they were even purged from their old sins and give glory to somebody else. God says, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. God says we're His little children. God loves us. God wants us. God holds His arms of love out as a child to a father and says, little children, come sit on my lap. Let me tell you some things. Let me encourage you. Let me remind you. He loves us, but He challenges us. To be, these type, to be this kind of a child. 
Amen. What kind of a child are you today? We all have to ask that. Could we be better children of God? Could we do more? Or are you even a child of God yet? Have you been saved, born again? If you have, may you challenge yourself today to do more for the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sure do love you.